Excellent. Good morning, morning. Uh, Dr. Morning. Pruitt, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, fellow board members, <coughs> my colleagues here at Thomas Edison. I, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today to speak about the Haven School of Arts and Sciences. To begin, I would like to say that we find ourselves at a critical juncture in the history of higher education in America. Higher ed is under intense scrutiny, being questioned for its effectiveness in terms of graduating students, whether we're not graduating enough students, we're not graduating them in timely fashion, we're not graduating them in a quality fashion. We're being asked, are we graduating students who possess the skills needed to succeed in today's workforce? Is today's student getting a favorable ROI for their tuition spent and the debt that they incurred, as we just heard? Is the taxpayer's money being used effectively as it subsidizes higher ed? The arts and sciences, what we refer to synonymously as a liberal education, liberal studies, or sometimes the liberal arts, is at the center of this moment. This presentation will serve to demonstrate how the Haven School of Arts and Sciences will look to move forward from this moment as it surveys not only where we're at right now, but also how we've gotten here. Though attributed to the statesman Winston Churchill, it was the philosopher George Santayana who told us that those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. A maxim, I might note, that would only come across in a liberal studies curriculum. <laughs> Our plan to move forward will indeed consider the past, and I will begin with a brief history of liberal education. In the fifth century AD, Martinius Capella defined the seven liberal arts as grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. These made up the entirety of a free man's education. As derived from the ancient Greeks, in the medieval Western University, these were divided into two parts, the trivium and the quadrivium, the arts and the sciences. These subject, subjects and skills were considered essential for a free person to know in order to take active part in a civic life, something that included participating in public debate, defending oneself in court, serving on juries, and most importantly, military service. To this day, this curriculum and the ideas embedded within them lives on in the arts and sciences. In today's world, the term liberal education or liberal arts also generally refers to matters not relating to the professional, vocational, or technical curricula. In today's world, at least in some circles, the term liberal education is tantamount to a vulgarity, thought of as useless, irrelevant, at the very least, not as important as a specialized education geared toward a specific professional aim. In the founding of America, a liberal education was seen as paramount from our founding fathers on forward. During the late 1770s, Thomas Jefferson authored and put forth Bill 79, a bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge. Jefferson argued for increased access to liberal education. He believed a broadly educated populace would strengthen democracy. Such men would not easily be swayed by tyrants. Still, during that early period, there were critics of the idea of a liberal education. Benjamin Franklin, for example, mocked liberal education for focusing on the frivolous accoutrements of privilege. For example, Harvard College's graduates were great blockheads as ever, only more proud and self-conceited. A century later, prominent thinkers were still weighing in on the value of a liberal education. For example, like Franklin before him, Booker T. Washington believed that there needed to be a connection between education and real life so that newly emancipated black Americans could determine their own economic fates. W.E.B. Du Bois, however, also advocating for African Americans, sought to broaden what counted as real life, more so like Jefferson, so that the original intent of a liberal education from the Greeks was also to be preserved. Tensions between these two visions lingered into the 20th century. 
1942, a consultant to what was then the Association of American Colleges worried that institutions of higher ed had abandoned the Jeffersonian view in favor of professional education, that colleges' curricula had deteriorated into a hodgepodge of training and technical skills. Still, in spite of the tension, from the inception of Harvard College to the post-World War II era, the prevailing consensus in America endorsed the ideals of a liberal education. They continued to dominate the world of higher ed. In fact, a presidential commission chartered by Harry S. Truman recommended in 1947 that colleges strive to more fully realize democracy in every phase of living, promote international understanding, and deploy creative intelligence to solve social problems. With this in mind, college still wasn't considered merely a pathway to get a job or to make a buck. The fact of the matter is, in spite of, and perhaps even because of, the tensions between the two positions, colleges have always done an excellent job at both, providing students a liberal education and, through that liberal education, and in some cases with some added specialized studies, preparing students with skills to achieve success in the workforce. However, during the turbulent 1960s, a shift in the national outlook took place where the Jeffersonian concept of liberal education began to be seen as secondary. The idea that higher ed's mission to foster the public and private good through the elevation of intellectual curiosity became, in some important circles, an idea that was anathema. As a result, the ideals of liberal education became lost in terms of prominence and focus. Professional specialized education as serving the workforce as its primary goal began to take hold. It still holds sway today. We might see then statistically how this has played out. The data shows the seismic shift in how American culture sees the role of liberal education and the role of college itself. For example, in the early 1970s, nearly three quarters of freshmen said it was essential to them to develop a meaningful philosophy of life. About a third felt the same about being very well off financially. As you can see by this chart, those fractions have flipped. In 1970, over 40% of college students nationwide were, were enrolled in liberal arts degrees. That number is less than 15% today, indicative of the proliferation of higher ed opportunities that focus on professions. Today, the most popular baccalaureate degree is, I ask anyone in this room for a guess, the most popular baccalaureate degree? Business, Business absolutely. And here, for those off-site on slide nine, are more statistics that demonstrate the shift away from liberal education, not only on the demand side, established by what students want to study, but also on the supply side, in what colleges offer to students. I'll just point our attention to the first of these statistics, which is very powerful. There are more students enrolled at the University of Phoenix alone than there are students enrolled at liberal arts colleges in America today. And yet, with the now 40 year long movement, emphasizing less on liberal study and more on education for specific professions and vocations, we find ourselves at a national crossroads with regards to higher ed, college graduates, and the workforce. The conversation is being held at both the state and national level, and it is loud. And as this conversation has reached a fever pitch and crescendo unheard of in our history, we have been forced to ask ourselves, in answer to the rising voices of our politicians and corporate leaders over the last five years or so, why is there such a dearth of talent in the American labor pool? It seems as if, despite the shift of our focus to specialized education, the outcomes we desire have failed to reach us. Why aren't companies getting graduates with the skills they need?
our colleges producing career-ready graduates. Our colleges and universities failing us. So this is where we're at now and a bit of how we have come here. But what of the future? I believe we are showing signs of a cultural reshifting, a reacknowledgement by culture and its workforce that the liberal arts best prepares students for the professions as it gives them the skills to think deeply and analytically, discern what's best in information, communicate effectively and work well with others, and most importantly in my mind, to learn for themselves. The reason I believe we will shift back lies largely in the type of world in which we have found ourselves inhabiting. We undoubtedly live in a world of information in which all industry will be dominated by data. Whether that data will come to serve largely a service industry, one dominated by manufacturing, or yet another unforetold, we may learn from Peter Drucker's ideas of what he calls knowledge workers. As we come to live in a world of knowledge and will require knowledge workers, Drucker tells us that in order to be productive and valued as an asset in the workforce that exists in an information age, knowledge workers need to be able to search on their own for problems as well as those solutions, to be able to manage themselves with little guidance, be innovative, and have the ability to learn for themselves and be motivated to continuously learn in order to produce quality work. All of this sounds like to me that this can define the prototypical Thomas Edison student. To demonstrate further our critical moment, I offer you key findings from a very recent survey. In these findings, we generally conclude two things. The first is that students, as the consumers of education, really aren't aware of what they need in order to succeed in the workplace. Nor are they, even post-graduation, very good assessors of their own skill sets. The second and most prescient is that employers believe graduates lack the skills they need. And, as we may extrapolate, those skills they lack are those that a liberal education might best provide. The survey tells us that employers believe that both broad knowledge and field-specific knowledge are needed for career success. Over 60% of surveyed employers believe so. We find that the employer's top priorities for student learning outcomes in college are those that are highly emphasized by and germane to a liberal education, communication, ethics, critical thinking, analyzing complex problems, locating and evaluating information. Employers value applied experience and tell us how valuable each example that you see here of applied learning would be for them in making a hiring decision. 60% of employers believe all college students should be expected to complete a significant applied learning project before graduating. Employers think that we need to improve what we're doing in these areas of preparing graduates. It stands to reason that if there is a lack of talent in the hiring pool, there must be a cause, and higher ed is in their crosshairs. You can see that over 50% of surveyed employers believe higher ed needs either moderate to major improvement in how we prepare students. You can also see that employers give college grads low scores for preparedness in these critical areas of communication and critical thinking, scoring in the 20th percentile. Please note how well students think they are doing <laughs> as they score themselves in the 60th percentile. Self-delusional. <laughs> Great inflation. So what can we do at Haven? A question that is ultimately begged then, can a liberal education 
curriculum that is well proven to enhance the very skills employers say that students need, can they continue to emphasize and deliver these critical skills in a new and applied way, giving the opportunity for students to learn through experience while also incorporating teamwork and the solving of real world problems in their curriculum. I say not only can they, but I believe that they must. I believe we in higher education must note the need to move our focus back to liberal education and to take bold steps to infuse this education in new experiential and suitable ways to benefit the student and the workplace. Though certainly not final, here is a broad outline of my plan to begin the process of revitalizing liberal education to make it the most effective way to educate students for the 21st century. My plan is framed by the categories of skills, suitability, and support. With skills, we will have a renewed focus on developing 21st century skills in new applied contexts, assessing how well our students gain those skills before they graduate. With suitability, we will give students the opportunity to learn relevant curriculum suitable for the world in which they work. And with support, we will find ways to support students by employing the most effective and appropriate learning methods, giving them opportunity to earn relevant credentials while enrolled at Thomas Edison. Let's start with skills. We will have a revitalized focus on those skills that employers want our graduates to have. Communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. These will be made to interact with the content of each course, no matter what the student is studying. And of course, they will be made to interact with each other. Acquiring these skills will transpire during the course of student action as an active, applied, and experiential learning, concluding in the creation of products that we find in the real world, such as white papers, group writing projects, e-journals, videos, podcasts, blogs, and the like. With your support at Thomas Edison, we will look to proactively create opportunities for students to learn in their workplaces and build these opportunities into the curriculum. We will have the distinct advantage of having our adult students, in many cases, already inhabiting the workplaces in which they can learn. We hope to provide opportunities for students to do what the American Association of Colleges and Universities calls signature work work that attempts to solve real world problems during the course of their studies. We hope to begin utilizing the scholar practitioner model and the model provided by the AACNU LEAP Challenge to launch us in this new direction. This model will provide us with the curricular structure from which we can build. Regarding curriculum, I now turn to what I call the suitability of what we offer. We will look to improve upon what we currently do from the top down, from the general education, to our degree programs and certificates in Haven, to our very courses. I would first turn your attention to recent institutional work done in the general education, where the Haven School plays a prominent role. Led by Bill Seaton, our chief academic officer, we have just this year revised the general education yet again to make it more suitable for the 21st century. For example, we will highlight our students' involvement in civic engagement, a hallmark of Jeffersonian liberal education. We also have added more flexibility for students to tailor their studies, especially into intellectual and practical skills area. In addition, we in Haven are specifically building curriculum that is suitable and relevant in the 21st century. For example, we have already devised new graduate programs in Gero Psychology, digital humanities, and industrial and organizational psychology that will launch this July. Programs that serve future workers in emergent professions. New programs in data science, creativity studies, and the biomedical sciences may also be on the horizon. Whatever new programs emerge from Haven, we will look to have as its hallmark 
a capstone experiential experience for the students to apply their learning to solve real world problems, enhancing the association between liberal education and professional life, and facilitating a sense of community and responsible ethical leadership. Courses in these programs will be devised to include project-based, problem-solving activities conducted online and in the workplace, activities that will ultimately create valuable student artifacts or products that they can add to their professional portfolios as they seek employment or, we hope, promotion. And finally, support. We will look to support our students in the best ways possible, especially in an increasingly competitive environment where the traditional brick and mortar school has entered our market and competes with us for market share. We must offer students what they may find elsewhere. We will look to provide valuable workplace credentials for students by scaffolding certificates within the majority of our best enrolled degree programs. For example, if a student develops an interest in a subject area, we will offer them a certificate for taking a few courses in that area. And if they so choose, they can apply that certificate and the work done for it to a more substantial credential, such as a degree. We will provide more courses that are offered directly here at Thomas Edison, providing students the opportunity and convenience, if they choose, to come to and stay at Thomas Edison from start to finish. Like Thomas Edison always has, whether online or through PLA, TSEP, guided study, we will provide educational opportunities that serves the student in the best delivery, delivery modalities for the 21st century. For example, competency-based education and online science simulations. Finally, we will proactively contact students to let them know of beneficial opportunities such as new certificates and our bachelor's to master's program. And as you see at the end of my list, there are things that perhaps we have not even thought of yet that we will hope to provide our students. All of this on the whole comprises an enormous task, but an important one. From its inception to this very day, Thomas Edison State College has been a leader in higher education from providing access to educational opportunities for working adults to now providing these same students the opportunities to better gain the skills that they need to achieve success. My hope is that the Haven School will help Thomas Edison continue to lead in the higher education field. It is critical that we build in our strong foundations in adult education and yet remain flexible to extend ourselves in new directions so that we do not fall behind neither failing our own college nor our students. Thomas Edison will continue to be the leader as higher education seeks to restore the significance of liberal education in our nation, including both notions that a liberal education serves the community by helping to foster good citizenship as well as providing the critical skills desperately needed in today's 21st century workforce. As leaders in adult education, we have the opportunity to leverage our position and our students' position, students who are already in the workforce, by fearlessly altering the model of how we educate, giving them a chance to do signature work by infusing real-world problems and experiential learning into our students' curriculum, providing them and the workplace a transformative experience to exact the better skills and outcomes that we desperately need. Yes, we still lead, but I believe this is our opportunity to once again be a pioneer, be a forerunner, the next model for the next 40 years in higher ed in these times that demand change. As we better impart to our students the necessary skills they need through a more suitable curriculum, adding appropriate support along the way, students will choose us not only for degree completion, but also for degree quality. Thank you for your time and attention.